Good morning and welcome to All Things Aviation. My name is Vince Mickens with the Private Air Media Group. Great show we're looking forward to today. It's uh, going to be pretty cool because in a few hours, we're going to be landing, well, I'm not going to be, but uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory and NASA are going to be landing the Perseverance uh, Mars rover on Mars. It's now just a few hours away from there. It's been a seven month journey. Uh, and of course, everybody's very excited about it because some of the technology that we'll be talking about today uh, that's involved with that project, that mission is, is actually pretty impressive stuff. Uh, and I think I just think the excitement of, uh, of, of it at this time. I think one of the things that was talking about this last week, uh, last week kind of sparked this show because I really didn't think I was going to be able to pull off having some guests about today's event on the day of the event. But, you know, miracles do happen. So, uh, but last week we had Dr. David Page. He's a UCLA professor in the Department of Earth Planetary and Space Planetary. I did that last week too, Earth Planetary and Space Studies. Um, he's also the RIMFAX Deputy Principal Investigator for the Perseverance. Um, RIMFAX stands for, it's an acronym for Radar Imaging for Mars Subsurface Exploration. And we had Anna Yeast. Uh, Zarefian, um, she is a systems engineer specifically for the uh, Perseverance. And then we were hoping to have from the Deep Space Network, uh, Dr. Joseph Lazio, uh, who's the chief scientist and the Interplanetary Network uh, Directorate for the Deep Space Network. But he got called to a meeting at the very last minute. So I was very fortunate to have uh, Annie Yeast and, and Dr. Page on. And as Dr. Page put it, we were pretty excited because of the fact that we're seeing the excitement in aerospace and in space exploration like we haven't seen in decades. Now, um, people like our young guest, uh, uh, Naya, she, she would, would have not even been around at that time, um, more like a thought, but uh, I'm sure uh, our other guests are, are familiar with what I'm talking about, and that's the excitement of, of space exploration back in the day that is now exciting again with all of the things that we're doing with this mission and uh, upcoming mission regarding the moon, uh, et cetera, and, and all of the other things and Jupiter and things like that. So pretty exciting stuff. And we had a really great show last week. So I said, you know, I'm going to give this a shot. I'm going to try to pull this off. And, and see what I can do. And, and while I'm mentioning that, I should also uh, thank NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory Digital News and Media Office. Um, there were several individuals there that were very helpful with, uh, and very patient with me, <laughs> with uh, trying to secure uh, guests for me and, and, and help me out to, to be able to do this today. So I wanna do a shout out to uh, Kala Cofield, uh, Ian O'Neill, DC Agile and Matt Siegel. Uh, all of them were instrumental in, in helping uh, move things forward. Uh, and of course, our, our first guest is the person I should thank the most because he kind of got the ball rolling when he said, yep, I'm available. Yep, we're busy, but I'm available. <laughs> so our first guest is Eric Aguilar. Eric uh, does a lot of things actually at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. He is a senior engineering manager he also is the assistant delivery manager of sampling. Uh, uh, is that caching? Yeah, caching. Uh -huh. Caching system uh, of the sample caching system. And he is the system test bed manager uh, for the Perseverance Mars rover. So Eric, welcome to the program. And thank you again for making yourself available at such an exciting time. Yeah, th no, thanks for having me, Vince. This is, this is great. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm super excited to, to talk with everybody today. Well, and we're super excited to have you. Next, we have the privilege of having Dr. Glenn Lightsey, who I was teasing earlier because I was like, Lightsey, Lightspeed. But actually, Dr. Lightsey is uh, with the Georgia Institute of Technology, better known as Georgia Tech. Dr. Lightsey is the director of Space Systems of the Space Systems Design Lab, which is part of Georgia Tech's Center for Space Technology and Research. Dr. Lightsey, did I get that right? Yeah, that's right. I'm in the School of Aerospace Engineering at Georgia Tech. Great. Well, thank you for uh, last minute availability to join us today. Happy to be here. Happy to have you. 
Which brings me to our shining star. And that was actually a term, Dr. Lightsey, you used just prior to us going live. We have a guest today. Her name is Ms. Naya Butler Craig. Naya is a PhD candidate, ironically, at Georgia Tech. Hey, this wasn't planned. It just worked out that way. S small universe. Um, but Naya is working on her PhD, as I mentioned, in, in aerospace, aeronautical, and astronautical space engineering, which involves the high power electric propulsion lab. Um, she got her undergrad in all of the above at Ember Riddle Aeronautical University down in Daytona Beach. And she was a graduate research fellow at NASA Space Technology. And then we could go on and on and on because she's been, a, been quite the busy young lady. Naya, it's great to have you join us today on such a, such a momentous day. Thank you for having me. I'm honored to share the panel um, and the platform with such awesome folks. So I'm excited. <laughs> yeah. So you, it is funny, you and Dr. Uh, Lightsey are familiar with each other in terms of he's familiar with what you're on your quest to do and, and the things that he has done and is doing at Georgia Tech. Absolutely. <laughs> so I'm going to start out, though, with Eric, because Eric, um, again, we're, we're, it's really great to have you. Let me just ask you, what's it feel like today? And, you know, we were talking to you before the show and you said, oh, well, this I've done this three times before. So three or four times. So so what's today like for you uh, with the latest rover going to Mars, with all of the new technology and with your intricate work on it? Yeah. So as you mentioned, Vince, right, we're this is my fourth Third mission, fourth rover to land on on on, on Mars or attempted landing, right? So, um, we uh, the first my first rovers were the uh, Mars Exploration Rover, Spirit and Opportunity. That's when I started my career at uh, JPL, and um, and you know it was exciting then, and you know uh, it's more um, I'll say not scared but anxious, right? It's 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 you know you. You put a lot of work, a lot of years into into these uh, developments, and uh, a lot of lot of time spent, and and uh, and then you get you know down to this, you know from to the wire, yeah, down to the wire. You get from the top, you know, from entry at you know, to from entry to touchdown at seven minutes. It you know it, that's that's got to be the toughest. You can do this yeah. stuff for years, and you can have the seven month uh, track of it launching and going there. Yeah. But the last seven minutes is it, the it most critical. Up, I've just heard that up, over and over. Right. It comes down to that. Right. And it's, it's, it's that time. And, and the way that, you know, the distance from Earth to Mars, right, it's, it's an 11 minute one way light time. So by the time it hits that, by the time we know that the signal said, hey, I'm, I'm entering the atmosphere, it's done. It's, it's on the ground, um, you know, hopefully in one piece. Right. And that's, right. that's the idea. <laughs> Right. But uh, it's on the ground. Right. So so, you know, you get that whole time. Now you're just waiting and you're hoping to see that you, everything's picking away as 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 expected. Right. So, um, so yeah, it doesn't get easier. It feels like. Yeah, I was going to say I, I've, I've watched a, a ton of videos in the last few weeks. It's funny. You guys actually put out a lot of information. I say you guys as in jet propulsion yeah. and NASA and Caltech, et cetera. There's a ton of information about this in terms of details. Of, of the building of the rover and the testing of it and the testing of the different components of it and things like that. Um, so it, it really draws you in. I mean, I, you know, it's one of those things where I was looking at a video the other night on our kitchen um, computer or whatever. And, and the, before I knew it, everybody else was gathering around going, Hey, what's that? That's really cool. <laughs> yeah, so, so it's pretty exciting. Uh, I've, I've got some other uh, questions to ask you about I, a whole bunch of questions. I could do a show just with you, Eric. Uh, but before I do that, I'd like to also get the feeling feel from uh, Dr. Lightsey about today and about this whole project and how excited you are for what you do and teach at Georgia Tech. Yeah, these these are uh, these are great days. Uh, these are sort of like community days where we all come together and sort of celebrate the space program, these launch and landing days. Uh, I think that's one of the things that's really nice. Eric mentioned that about, about space projects is kind of there is that ultimate day where it, it either works or it doesn't work, right? And, it, and we're all watching and it's, it's a community event. Uh, so it taps into like our collective consciousness and um, it's very inspirational. So that to me, that's why 
one of the reasons I got into the space uh, program is the just the drama and uh, the the excitement of those flight opportunities. So here we are. We're kind of reaching the culmination of this journey to get this rover on the surface of Mars. We're going to make all these amazing discoveries. And it's a great moment to just kind of take stock and say, wow, we've, we've really come a long way and celebrate that. So Sure. Does it, does it help you um, with the students? Do they get inspired by events like this oh, where yes. all of the things that they've been learning now are kind of coming to fruition, at least in, in terms of what's going on with a project like this? Sure. Yeah, it really uh, it helps our students. I, you know, they they all participate and watch, and uh, I think it inspires them to get their homework assignments done and things like that. We were just talking in my class about interplanetary trajectories, and you know, we can talk about perseverance as a case study of that. So it's yeah. really Naya, I saw you shaking in, <laughs> in agreement. So, and as a, as a PhD student studying all of this, all of the above, um, how, how's this stay to you? It's, uh, I think Dr. Lightsey hit the nail on the head there. Um, it's, it definitely puts into perspective everything that we've been doing. When you're in grad school or in school in general, you're knee deep in the research or, or the classwork and you kind of forget the bigger picture. And it's these days that kind of remind you um, kind of what you're working toward and that it's not just, you know, the projects that you're doing in class or in school or trying to get an A, um, you could actually eventually contribute to amazing um, te technological feats such as what we're doing today. So it's so one of the questions that I get every show, and mm -hmm. it's, it's probably the most popular question is, how'd you get into it? How'd you get started? So, but what's fun today is I can do this with you, Naya, how did you get into aviation? I mean, in, into aerospace. When when did the spark happen? How young were you? What 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 was the what made it obvious that this was a, a direct? Because you're like, we were talking about it before the show, Doctor Doctor Lightsey, and we're talking about you're everywhere. Your name is everywhere, and if it has anything to do with space, uh, and and you were talking about your aspirations to become an astronaut, you're all over it. So where did where did that come from? Absolutely. That's one of my favorite questions because I think I have an interesting kind of background. Um, no one in my family has ever done aerospace and I never had that exposure from young, but um, I think I was around seven years old when I kind of showed that I was very interested in engineering. And um, that was shown by the fact that I drew a car and I did the underbody of that car and I was sure it could run on oxygen. I don't know how I knew. I just knew that this car would be able to run on anything but fuel. Um, and then I think another instance after that, which is a story my mom loves to tell, is um, I had learned about the water cycles recently. And then I was running out of the shower because I saw the condensation on the mirror, like screaming at my mom, the water cycle's happening in our bathroom. And I was just so fascinated by that. <laughs> That's her favorite embarrassing story to tell. And so I'm stealing her thunder right now. But um, th that was from very young. It's a great story. Thanks. <laughs> it's it. Yeah, it's very on brand for me, but um, it wasn't until eighth grade that I took a class called Earth Space Science, and that's when I learned about space. Okay. Um, it was like the, the phases of the moon, um, just how vast space is, and I just found myself very intrigued by how mysterious it was. So um, your last year of middle school, is that's when it really, you, you were able to start putting it together. Yes, and I, I learned I like science, I like engineering, and I like space, and so I took a PERT test that told me I was supposed to be like a veterinarian. I didn't like that answer. So I researched what I liked, which were those three things. And that's how I discovered um, aerospace engineering. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll come back to you, uh, Dr. Lightsey. Your, your experience in terms of teaching and, and your, your involvement with all of these students and everything, um, wh what are some of the things that come to mind right away with you uh, that make uh, students that are interested in space exploration and aerospace a standout? Yeah, aerospace is an interesting field because I think most, most people that choose to go into it, it's really a, a passion project. Like you, you, you love this idea of being able to fly in the air or being able to go to places we've never been before. And this whole idea of humanity and just expanding our, our, our knowledge and our ability to go out and do things. Um, as, as, a, as a world. And once you buy into that, you sort of uh, never look back really. And, and most of our students, you know, they're not, 
in it for money or um, honestly, what? It's a hard path. <laughs> yeah, right. It, it, it's I mean, it's 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 a hard path because you have to work hard and learn and it doesn't get easier. But you you do it because you love it. Right. You do it for love. And, and it's great to share that. You know, when I talk to students about that, um, we, it's something we all have in common. We can relate to one another through our our love of the subject and what it means for our our world, basically. Wow, uh, that's that's pretty impressive to hear you say that it's more for the love and the passion uh, than for the dollar. Uh, that's that's a that's a really great point to bring up because we always hear, uh, and it's a, it's a diversion from what we normally hear, which is that kids are looking for that you know next thing. Although I have to say, including raising three daughters myself, today kids are looking for purpose as well as anything else. So they want they want to find something that they can really sink their teeth into and feel good about it. Uh, and yes, it would be nice to get paid, but it, it isn't uh, necessarily at the forefront. Uh, Eric, I'm gonna come back to you and ask you some questions. I actually am getting bombarded about, when are you gonna talk about the helicopter, the helicopter? <laughs> In a minute, I wanna talk, <laughs> want talk about the rover first. Um, I just named several things that you do, Eric. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit more specifically about your job there and, and what your experience has been working on the Perseverance? Yeah, sure. So I have, a, as you mentioned, uh, two titles, right? Um, and, you know, they're, they're uh, uh, I would argue, both full-time jobs, but uh, I was able to spit it, kind of spit my time. I think uh, one of my, uh, my project manager mentioned it's, you know, even though it's 50%, you got to look at what the denominator is, right? That's how, you know, how big that number really is. Then you can see how much work he's really putting in. And so, you know, it was a lot of hours and a lot of work, but uh, for, for the sample caching system, right? My, my job was the uh, uh, system engineering. So I was, I was a, so we were a fairly big subsystem, um, right? We have the uh, about almost half of the actuators that are on the on the rover are part of the sample caching system, and and it's sort of the uh, uh, I'd argue one of the reasons we're going to Mars, right, is to actually collect and and cache these samples. So um, we have we have people that I'm sorry to interrupt you, but we have people that aren't familiar with with certain technical terms. Can oh, you okay. tell us what a caching sample caching system is? Oh, okay. I want to let everybody know it's caching as in C A C H E, not C A S H. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> uh, Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so the, 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 the rover has, you know, obviously we have a, a rover that can drive around. It's a geologist, right? So it can drive around. It has a mass for vision, you know, uh, hazard avoidance cameras. Um, but one of the things that we have is, is the, what we call the sample caching system. And it's a robotic system on the front end of the rover that consists of a, uh, a robotic arm, a five degree of freedom robotic arm. And at the end of that robotic arm, we have about a 45 kilogram uh, turret with a, a coring drill. And this drill is meant to actually take core samples out of the rock, um, out of the rocks on Mars and, and eventually uh, pass them inside to the rover where we have the sample handling system inside the rover, right? And what we do is we actually are able to uh, take the rock samples, they're in tubes once they come back from the core, out of the core, and we're able to um, uh, uh, put a seal and, and activate a, a hermetic seal around that, that sample tube. And eventually that sample tube will be uh, uh, dropped on the, on the surface of Mars for a future mission to uh, come and pick them up and then bring them back uh, to Earth. And so the, the, the sample caching system, as I was mentioning, right, it has this, this, uh, um, this robotic arm that allows us to uh, pinpoint locations on the surface and, and, and collect samples. So the uh, sample caching is essentially the, the acquiring of a sample and, and, and storage of it, uh, uh, sealing and storage of it and, and, and uh, have it for a future mission. To, to so one of the things I like to point out about that uh, in terms of what I've seen and read and heard is those samples as an example have to be stored uh, because it's going to be a while before they're able to get them, you know, get them returned here and use them, that type of thing. But, but the thing I want to point out is that there are a lot of people involved. When I was talking with Anna East last, last week, she was saying that there are, you know, the team of people that are involved both 
for the testing, but also outside of it that contribute to different aspects of this is pretty massive. Um, what can you tell us about some of the things, for example, in with your team of the testing and, you know, I've got a picture of you in the, uh, almost looks like a hazmat suit. Yeah. <laughs> tell us a little bit about those kind of things. Yeah. So, yeah. So we actually have, uh, it, it, as, as Anais mentioned, right, there's a large group of, of uh, subcontractors, not only in vendors of, of machine shops, but also uh, subcontracts for like, for instance, the robotic arm, right? That was actually something that we uh, uh, had to subcontract out, right? And, and so, although we have the expertise, we didn't have the bandwidth uh, to, to actually build it. So um, this local company uh, in Pasadena was able to uh, uh, build that with, you know, with us in conjunction with us, right? Provide the, you know, we provide some requirements and, and, and we work with them to, to get that built. And so, yeah, there's a, there's a, a and, and then you look at all the payloads, all these science instruments, Right. Those are from different universities or, you know, as you mentioned, uh, you know, RIMFAX, right, from, you know, the, the UCLA, yep. UCLA and, and, you know, we have um, Arizona State University, right, for the, the Mass Cam Z and, and we have, you know, instruments from around the world, right, that are all on this rover. So it's, it's a, uh, it is definitely a, a, a collaborative and, and, you know, a group effort to get to where we're at. Um, sure. One and, of the, um, the, the RIMFAX a scientist is actually in Norway or something yeah. that coordinated with Dr. Uh, Craig um, exactly. about, you know, the device and the, the particulars of it and that type of thing. Um, let me go to Dr. Leitze for a minute from Georgia Tech. Dr. Leitze, how do you uh, guide students in terms of what direction they may go once they start in your aerospace programs there? You know, like most freshmen and sophomores, when they get into school, they know they want to do something with space exploration or in the aerospace field, but they're not sure which. And I'm bringing it up for, for a couple of reasons, because Naya and I, when we were talking uh, briefly yesterday, as I said, she's an aspiring astronaut, um, but she's just as curious about the unmanned uh, type of missions as well. So, so let's hear your perspective, Dr. Lightsey, on that. Sure. Well, first of all, let me say that um, space exploration and building spacecraft is really not just for aerospace engineers. Uh, we, it is incredibly multidisciplinary. Everything is connected. And uh, so there's mechanical, there's electrical, there's computer science, you know, there's uh, systems engineering. So all these things go together. Um, and we, we, we can have students from lots, you know, you don't have to be an aerospace engineer to build a spacecraft. I'm glad you're saying that. Uh, I, I've had people from JPL tell me that on previous shows that they have people from a lot of different disciplines that aren't necessarily even an engineering discipline. Go ahead. Yeah, and, and in our labs, you know, we're really looking for that kind of diversity of skills uh, from students. So we're really building teams of students with lots of different skills. Um, but, you know, I, when, when you come in as like an undergrad, I think all we really... All you need to know is, do you like math and science? And are you interested in aircraft or spacecraft? And that's really enough to get into aerospace. College is really a, a try, you know, it's a time of trying things and learning. And, you know, some people will find that, yes, that's exactly their passion. That's what they want to do. Some people will learn that maybe they're more interested in something else they didn't know about. And that's perfectly okay. And then we have students that come into aerospace from other disciplines that maybe didn't know about it. So, it, over time, it's a gradual process of specializing. It doesn't happen overnight. And you don't have to come in with like a preformed idea of exactly what you want to do. You will learn about things. And even by the time you get to grad school, what I tell our incoming grad students is all you really have to know is do you want to do aircraft or do you want to do spacecraft? By then, you should have enough information to decide sort of which part of the, of the industry you want to go into. But other than that, you know, it's still pretty, pretty open. And actually, even one thing we teach is never stop learning. And uh, your career will take you in unexpected directions. And you might end up doing something you never even knew about as a, as a student. But that ability to learn, that kind of lifelong commitment to learning will take you where you want to go. Yeah, it's funny. You're echoing the sentiments of uh, a Dr. Um, Page last week. He said the exact same thing. Your lifelong learning. 
Uh, that's a good segue to you, uh, who's in the early stages of your lifelong learning. Naya, uh, tell us a little bit about your path uh, once you got, uh, you, you, you got accepted into Embry-Riddle and you started working towards uh, this lofty goal of yours to, to go to Mars as an astronaut. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yes. Listen to her. Absolutely. Sure. I want to go to Mars. <laughs> I don't mind. Have at it. I'm too old. <laughs> <laughs> I'm definitely, I think I'm excited for the moon too. That, that's been a dream of mine, but um, Embry-Riddle is, was my starting grounds um, and I learned so much there, um, but I always kind of knew that I wanted to be within the space realm because um, when you do, or when you, I guess, declare your aerospace engineering major, you end up having to choose a, a track. And there was aeronautics, um, propulsion, and astronautics, and I took the astronautics route. Um, and so just like Dr. Leitze said, I was, <laughs> I was immediately laser focused on space. <laughs> I didn't really do any of the, um, and, and I actually envy a lot of people who have that flexibility within their, within themselves to kind of explore everything in aerospace. It's, it's so broad and there's so much to learn. Um, but I've always been super focused on, um, that. And then, um, it wasn't until my sophomore year that I got my NASA pathways internship. Um, and during my first uh, rotation with them is when I discovered um, electric propulsion. And I was a sophomore, um, already kind of had my NASA thing set up. So I was like, okay, what's next? I definitely want to do grad school. And then I discovered electric propulsion. And I said, that's what I'm going to study in grad school. And um, I ended up graduating, um, coming to Georgia Tech, and now I'm doing electric propulsion here. And I absolutely love it. I really believe that um, electric propulsion is what's going to take us to the furthest boundaries. It's a very efficient, uh, propulsion technology, and I know that it's uh, most desirable for long duration missions. And I believe in deep space exploration. Um, I, I know Mars is one kind of stepping stool to that, which is which makes this so exciting because I know we're only going to go further. And I think what I'm doing in grad school right now is going to enable those missions in the future. <laughs> Very good. Um... You had me captivated there. I lost my train of thought. But anyhow, <laughs> let, let, me, let, me, let me go back to Dr. Lightsey. And Dr. Lightsey, I was going to ask you a couple of questions. One that had to do with your um, um, lab and what, that, what does that entail? What, what, what is the lab all about? Um, a lot of us, when we hear lab, we just think of laboratory. But uh, a lot of times in school, um, when it's a, a space lab type of a thing, there's a lot more to it. So if you could tell us a little bit about that. And, and some of the things that you uh, you guys focus on with what you teach there at Georgia Tech. Sure. Well, if you think about sort of modern education and what what is engineering education like today, really classwork, I would say it's it's important. I mean, it's it's always been important, but you know, I would say the work that you do kind of outside of class now is more important than ever. It's probably in my mind, it's 50-50. So it's what you study in the class, but also what you do in projects, in team environments, because that's really the environment you're gonna be in after you graduate. And so our lab creates that. It's basically a, a flight project uh, lab. Um, the things we have, the, the two common themes that happen in our lab is everything we do is space, that's in our title, and everything we do is flight missions. So we wanna build things that actually go into space. Uh, I, I, one of my cliche jokes is uh, if it sits on a table, it's not a spacecraft, right? For it to be a spacecraft, it has to go into space. So we wanna teach people how to build by, how to learn by doing. And so they actually are making these, you know, CubeSats and um, uh, hardware for flight missions. We're, we're partnered with NASA, just like other universities are on various missions. There's one called Lunar Flashlight that's gonna look for ice on the moon and we're doing that uh, by, we're helping to enable that by providing a propulsion system for them. So our students come in, they get plugged into these jobs where we rely on the students. I mean, we, we, we don't have full-time employees. So our students are, are filling that role for us and they get a lot of responsibility early on. They're working directly with NASA or Air Force uh, government you know, sponsors and interacting with the engineers in those organizations like wow, what a great experience yeah exactly and they come out with years of this experience so that they can contribute really immediately in their career and kind of get going quickly so that's that's our goal gotcha eric back to you with the uh, rover that's about to land uh, 
what what are the things that with all of the things that you've been doing and the testing, et cetera, and so forth, you you in terms of your area of responsibility, what will you be anxiously awaiting after the seven minutes of of it landing? So once it lands, uh, it's all about for me uh, the sample caching, right? It's it's getting you know, deploying our robotic system and actually taking a sample out of the ground, right? We've spent, um, I spent about six years, you know, thinking about that, right? Working towards that, you know, designing, building, testing. Six years? Uh, yes. Yeah. Wow. Um, yeah. We've, we've uh, you know, from, we took a concept on a, essentially a whiteboard from a whiteboard all the way through to, to now where we're flying it, right? And, and, you know, we had to develop the technology. We had to you know, put it together, develop the software algorithms that go with it. Remember, this is an autonomous system. So we're I was able gonna to ask you, so it's gonna do some things on its own, but if I understood last week, if I, if I got it correctly, you guys can send updated commands? Yeah, we tell it what to do. So there's not, it's not artificial intelligence, it's autonomy. So we tell it what to do, but then once we tell it what to do, it does that on its own. So gotcha. it doesn't think for itself, right? It, it, but, okay. it does, but it does do all the work on its own, right? So we tell it, uh, for instance, you know, we'll take images of, of a, a, route, a rock outcrop, right? And we'll say, okay, you know, the scientists will say, ah, I think I want to take a sample out of that rock, you know, you know, here in the, in the picture. And we can give it a coordinate system to the rover and say, please take, you know, let's take that, let's take a sample from there. And, and the rover is designed and we designed it to be within, I think our requirement is within three centimeters of you telling it that coordinate system. It'll actually go and take a rock sample out of there and it'll do it autonomously. It'll, it'll deploy the robotic arm, it'll go, it'll, it'll drill, it'll take the sample and it will go and store it and, and tell you that it's done. Um, awesome. And, and yeah, I think that's a good point that you bring between autonomy and artificial intelligence because I think sometimes they get blurred or, or blended. Yeah. And yeah, I, I get by that. by me as well as anyone else. It's uh, but that's a that's a really good point. Um, maybe I've watched too many sci-fi movies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm picturing this this rover doing its own thing yeah, yeah. <laughs> with its yeah. own uh, you know AI mind. But yeah. no, that's that's a really good point. Um, I, as I mentioned earlier, and I know this is not necessarily your specific area of expertise. But can you give us any insight about the helicopter? Uh, I was looking at some information about it, and it's pretty fascinating because the atmosphere is different there. And so the design of it was very critical in terms of it, it functioning. But it is a test of a new technology uh, or a drone type of technology that if it works well out there, uh, it's going to really open up a new frontier for exploring uh, the surface of Mars. Right, as, as you mentioned, right, it's a, it's a, you can argue it's a tech, tech demonstration, right? We're, we're demonstrating this new technology on Mars and, and yeah, you, you hit it right on the point, right? There's, there's the atmosphere, it's only 1% of, of Earth. So it's about uh, seven tor and, you know, uh, 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 pressure out there. So the way you do the, the lift and, and the blades of, on the, you know, on the helicopter have to be different than what you would do normally on, on Earth. So that had to get obviously designed. The next thing was is testing, right? How do we make sure that this is going to work on Mars, right? So we have a 25 foot space simulator. Uh, it's about 25 foot in diameter. That's why it's uh, named that. It's also about 80 feet tall. Okay. And so in, in that, in there, they were actually able to create the Martian atmosphere, both in temperature and 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 pressure. And, and then they, they did use some offload fixtures because they, you know, remember uh, Mars is about 40% gra you know, uh, gravity to, uh, to Earth, right? So right. A lot, everything's a lot lighter, right? So they use these offload fixtures to kind of help uh, get the, uh, you know, make sure that, that, that they understood the principles of, of the flight for the, sure. for the yeah. helicopter. And, and we did a ton of testing in there, right? To make sure that we can, we understood, you know, how does this you know, how does this helicopter work within, you know, within that uh, atmosphere and, and under those conditions, right? So it, it's, right. it's great. And, and it'll enable us once on Mars, you know, it's, uh, it's not, I'll, I'll say it's obviously part of our mission, but it's not a, an integral piece of the mission. In other words, um, you know, we expect it to work just fine and, and to do its job, but if it was to fail, it's not going to keep us from from performing from doing everything else that you need to right. do. 
Right. That's so. right. But but it will allow us to, you know, as you get a, a bird's eye view, right? You you fly up a little bit, you now get a, a, a little closer view and understanding of what might be around you and you might you might make a different decision on, on where you thought you were gonna drive next, right? Versus, you know, based on what the helicopter uh, images and then sends back to the rover and, and obviously down to the ground for us to see. Yeah. So I I, I, you know, again, the information about it was just fascinating. The testing that you just mentioned uh, and and the fact that it really won't fly for a long time. It can fly for short intervals. Uh, then it has to kind of recharge. Yeah. Uh, and the whole power thing that uh, I, I by the way, I was really showing my age last week when when I was talking about like solar power and stuff and they're like uh no vince we have a nuclear power device on the <laughs> on the rover so it can last for a long time yeah. um and uh that was that was pretty impressive too speaking of power and propulsion and that type of thing uh, i'm going to go back to to naya for a minute because for one uh, I, I think naya you're going to have to break from us like a 20 till or a quarter till yes sir mm -hmm. okay so I want to make sure I have a chance to ask you a couple of more things while you're while you're on. Naya has to go to another Zoom call, so <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just kidding. Um, uh, propulsion is something you've mentioned a couple of times, and seems like something you're very interested in. So it seems very perfect that you are at Georgia Tech, uh, studying there with with what Dr. Lightsey just said about what they're working on right now. Um, what why your interest in propulsion in particular, and what what are you hoping to to learn with with this? Absolutely. Um, I would say I'm interested in propulsion just because I know that's how we get places. And I know there's so much science to learn in propulsion and the different types of propulsion. Um, with chemical uh, propulsion, I was always interested because uh, the shock factor, it's a big fiery ball. And then I got into electric propulsion because well, one, I just thought it was a very interesting and novel technology. And then the other side of it is the fact that it's so efficient that I know that's what's going to drive us, you know, um, to those long duration missions. And so what I hope to eventually contribute um, to the industry is optimizing electric propulsion for those long duration space, um, deep space exploration missions. Um, and it's like going to Mars, like going to Mars and beyond. <laughs> and I, beyond. I definitely. Oh, okay. <laughs> Mars yeah. is seven months. I'm good with that for now. No, I'm, I'm kidding. It doesn't matter what I think Fair about enough. it. <laughs> no, that's that's, uh, that's great. That's um, that's quite a, a thing for your undertaking. I was going to say. Absolutely, it's yeah. um, it's there's so much out there within propulsion itself. Um, whether it comes to optimization, um, and even hybrid propulsion, and I just think that that's the most exciting because that is how we get places. That's our fuel. So. Dr. Lightsey, can you piggyback on that? Yeah, I mean, this, this is great. Naya is a real rocket scientist. So, you know, one of the things you know, she pointed out is um, the efficiency. And that, that makes a huge difference for these very far away destinations. You know, you, Mars is so hard to get to that, um, you know, you have, you have to take a, a huge amount of propellant for just one kilogram of payload. And if you can uh, increase that efficiency by a factor of 10, let's say, that makes a huge difference in terms of the size of the spacecraft and the size of the rocket and how much you can actually get to the surface of Mars. And so when we start to talk about things that are gonna require infrastructure, uh, you know, multiple vehicles interacting with each other, maybe building things on the surface, um, the, these advanced propulsion techniques are, are critical. Like we can't, we physically cannot do it without them. Sure. Yeah. Speaking of, of uh, the, the, you know, things like weight and that type of thing, Eric, I wanted to ask you when you guys were working on this for the last six months, <clears throat> excuse me, did you have to take that in consideration in terms of what materials were used uh, to have the strength to do the digging and sampling and that type of thing, but yet stay within certain guidelines uh, regarding weight? Yeah, for, for actually for not only for mass, uh, you know, we had to, we had to watch the, the mass of the rover. We couldn't go, we, we pretty much had to fit within the envelope of the previous rover, right? We're, we're more or less at the, at the maximum mass that you can put on another planet safely where it's not so much, um, you know, we can always build a bigger rocket. It's not so much getting it there, it's stopping it, right? That's, that's the, the critical part of all this, right? So 
the, the mass uh, and our technology with the EDL and the sky crane and, and, you know, the parachutes and everything is sort of uh, optimized now for, for the mass that we're able to send. Um, but yeah, we definitely have to watch for the mass when we're, when we're designing the, uh, the sample caching system. So we were given an allocation, if you will. But also we had to watch what materials we use because we are looking for microbial life. We, there was certain materials that the scientists just said, hey, we don't want you using this stuff because if it chips or if it, you know, as you're working in, in, in rocks and- It and, could and contaminate. Still, it could contaminate or make it look like there's something there that's not really there, right? That, that, we, that we brought. Wow, so, so then you have to work really close with the geologists and whatever other specialties. Uh, absolutely, yeah. We were, and, and that was part of the collaboration, right? We had, uh, we, were, we were, you know, uh, in step, locked up with the science community, right? The, as far as, you know, what, what we could use. And, and I, I sort of joked that, you know, they took the periodic table and said, okay, you can't use all this stuff. <laughs> and they crossed out a big portion of it. And we said, okay, that makes our job a little harder. Yeah. So we, you know, we had to decide and, and, and work towards, you know, how do we, how do we manage uh, not only mass, but also the materials that we're allowed to use, right? And, and methods. So, it was a lot of uh, development that we did as far as making sure we were able to meet everybody's requirements and, 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 and get there. Again, and, and again, it comes back around to that you can be into a lot of different uh, uh, aspects of things in terms of what your uh, interests are, your career goals, and that like you can be a geologist or a microbiologist or biologist or whatever, and that applies to space exploration. In oh, fact, yeah, uh, it was funny. We had uh, uh, um, uh, the chair of the human flight stuff at UND, um, um, uh, Dr. De, De, De Leon, and he was talking about uh, the fact that, well, if you're out there traveling for seven months to Mars and you get a toothache, who's going to know how to fix it? Yeah. <laughs> so you could be a dentist going to Mars. Who knows? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm probably stretching that not quite the way he was saying it. But listen, uh, let me uh, ask you this real quick. Uh, and I'll, um, in fact, I was going to come back to you on it. So I'll, I'll do this. Uh, Naya, I don't want to hold you up from your other call. But mm -hmm. as a young lady who is working her way uh, up into a, a fantastic industry, what, what recommendations or advice, I should say, what do you have for your peers and for those coming up through middle school and high school uh, for our young audience that that's that's thinking about uh, doing something in aerospace, space exploration, et cetera? Um, absolutely. My favorite and most important piece of advice is always um, mentors. Uh, make sure that you find them. It definitely takes a village to um, to. I guess, evolve in this industry. And especially if you're like me, your first generation college or grad student, that mentorship and just the guidance from people who've been through things um, that you will eventually get to um, is invaluable. So definitely find mentors and network to get work. <laughs> Any challenges that you uh, recommend on how to navigate that you've, that you've had as you've come up? Absolutely. Um, I've had my fair share of academic challenges. Um, I, I failed the class in undergrad and, and uh, that taught me a lot about how to deal with failure because I thought that that was kind of the end of my career pretty much. And um, my response to that, the things I learned from overcoming that obstacle was huge. And especially when it comes to science and failure in general, they kind of have to go hand in hand in order to progress. And that is something as a researcher that I'm learning again in grad school um, and, and something that I think is gonna be important in my, um, what do you call it, in my path to becoming an astronaut, that perseverance, that grit to overcome those failures um, and to basically find solutions fast. Because that's what an engineer is, a solution finder, solution maker, so. Gotcha. Listen, thank you very much for, for taking the time to squeeze us in to be uh, on the program with us and for all of your valuable insight uh, with what you do. We want to wish you the very best with your uh, pursuit of your PhD and being an astronaut. And who knows all of the things that you're probably going to do in the industry. Pretty excited uh, about it and excited for you. So thank you for being, being with us. Uh, whenever you need to, you can go ahead and, and drop out. But thanks. Thanks very much. Drop out of the call. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> but thank, thank you very much for being with us.
Thank you. I learned so much from you, uh, Eric, and, and thank you for your expertise, Dr. Lightsey, and thank you for having me, Vince. This was great. <laughs> thank, thank it's you, it's absolutely a pleasure. So we're going to continue the conversation. And, you know, it's a perfect segue to you, uh, Dr. Lightsey. What, with kids that are in, uh, students that are, that are in your programs, um, and they're trying to find their way, but they may be, you know, they may have some challenges. Um, what do you recommend to them? How do you guide them uh, or have your, you know, the other professors guide them uh, in terms of moving forward? Yeah, I mean, challenge is always going to happen, right? I mean, if you're pursuing any goal that is, uh, you know, worthwhile, you, uh, somewhere along the way, there are going to be setbacks. And it's really about how you respond to challenge that matters as much or more than just getting, you know, having a setback. So, um, uh, you know, I, I just tell students to stick with it, to persevere in the spirit of today. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, really, if, if you have a long-term commitment to a goal, you know, you, you're not going to give up on your goal the first time something happens that sets you back. Um, so, um, you know, just stay, stay with the, the motivations that drove you to, to where you are and, uh, and follow through and, and learn from your experiences. So if something happens that's not what you planned, ask how did how did that happen why did that happen what can i do to get better right so that's right. Really an improvement process well and school is a good place to toughen up in because at space exploration and all things uh, aviation and aerospace really do present their challenges uh and and you will have you, you're gonna you know actually sometimes failure is part of the learning process and and it's you have to be prepared to deal with that yeah, it's going to happen eventually at some level. All of us have experienced failure. So don't don't worry about it if it happens to you. I mean, it's not something anybody really should enjoy, but but it's normal. And how you respond is what matters. Got you. Um, while I have you, uh, one of the things I haven't done through the uh, since the beginning of the show, how did you get into this? Where, where, where did you start? Where are you from? And what was the spark? Uh Okay, so I, I'm, I'm old enough that I was, a, you know, like five years old when the lunar landings were happening. So I actually watched those on TV. I can remember seeing those when they were being broadcast. And uh, uh, apparently, according to my parents, I told my parents I was going to build a hotel on the moon. So when we get to that <laughs> point, um, that I guess I'll get into the hotel business. Uh, but I've just always been really passionate about space. You know, a couple of times I considered other career paths. Um, and in the end, I stuck with what I knew I wanted to do. You know, I, if you kind of listen to your inside voice, it sort of tells you what, what you care about. And um, I've never regretted that. I mean, I think, I think doing the things that you're passionate about is really the secret to happiness. Um, what did you think you wanted to do before you zeroed in on aerospace? I don't know. You know, I, I just, I've always been very math and science oriented. I've, I just thought that was very fascinating. Uh, I love kind of the beauty of, of math and um, uh, just, just learning. Um, so I, I think those were the things that uh, I, I started out with an interest in, and then I just gradually became more and more involved in space. And then it was more like, where can I make a contribution? How can I help? Right. What, what can I do? And that's, and then I, you know, I also really enjoy working with students and I like explaining things. Um, I gave a seminar and someone said, you know, you ought to consider that as a career path. And so that's how I ended up where I am. Yeah. And when was that? When did you zero in on what you were going to probably be doing from that point on? Or you mean being a professor or yes. being, yeah. Well, so, yeah, both actually. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, I you know, I, I have kind of a systems background. So I, I was in guidance and control systems is really where I started. And there's okay. a fair amount of math in that. And that was what appealed to me. Um, but also when I was in grad school, I gave a seminar to, a, you know, we had like a brown bag series mm -hmm. and um, I, you know, kind of, had been learning some things. So I kind of taught a little bit about what I was learning. And that's where people were like, you could be a professor, you should do this. So uh, I, I didn't do it right away, but I kind of kept that in my mind. And then when the opportunity came along, I figured, well, what the heck, I'll try it. And I've really enjoyed it. 
Great. Eric, how about you? Where, where did things start for you? Well, I think similar where to... Where are you from, uh, Eric? So I'm from uh, Los Angeles. I was born and raised in Los Angeles, uh, California. An L.A. baby. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and who, likes, who likes to mess with people about the weather? Let's yeah. pass the weather. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, and, and honestly, growing up, uh, you know, I didn't even know JPL existed down the street from me, right? I mean, it was, you know, maybe I grew up uh, probably 15 miles south of JPL. And um, it wasn't until, you know, I started obviously like, like Dr. Lighty mentioned, right. You know, math and science was something that really appealed to me. And, and so I, you know, eventually thought, what can I do with that? And, you know, electrical engineering was, um, was sort of kind of popped up. Like, this is something that I, I think I can get into and, 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 you know, electronics is everywhere. So I should be able to find a job for sure. Right, right after college. Right. And, and um, you know, I, I aerospace was, uh, a passion, but I didn't think I'd, I'd get to where I'm at today, right? Where, you know, I sort of came in, um, you know, after after I graduated from college, I actually started contracting with JPL um, through, through a different company, you know, working on, on some uh, avionics and electronics design. And then that's that's where I got the, you know, that that's the aha moment, right? That's where it says, this is what I like, right? When I, when I stopped, you know, uh, my, 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 uh, my wife would, would tell me, Hey, sometimes you don't, you know, you stay, you stay at work pretty late, you know, what's going on. And it's like, you just kind of, I get into it and I just kind of forget that everything's <laughs> happening around me. Right. And so you're like, it's legitimate. Yeah. It's legitimate. It's, yeah. 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 <laughs> Trust me. There's nothing going on. And, and, um, and, and honestly, I'm having an affair with a Rover. <laughs> that, that's right. That's, that was the, that was the mistress was the, was the Rover. Right. And, and, uh, uh, I, and, and, you know, early on in, in our, our marriage, uh, uh, she said, she said, you know, you're coming home kind of late. And I said, yeah, only because I'm married. If I wasn't, I'd probably still be at work just doing this stuff. I go, cause I really like <laughs> that's, it. That's serious passion, buddy. <laughs> that's serious. You know, but, uh, I've been able to scale that back a little bit, but, uh, but no, you know, there are still those days that I'll go into work. And, and again, I, I kind of forget about that. I'm working. It's not, it, it doesn't feel like work sometimes so i'm able to you know the work that that you know i really obviously really enjoy because i'm not watching a clock right and and sometimes i i do realize that wow i've been here you know it's eight nine o'clock at night and well, maybe i should stop and get dinner right yeah. and so you know that's when like, you're really into it what's the yeah. atmosphere like in your work environment there not just the test but everything that you do at jpo what's what's it like working there yeah, it, it's it's a it's actually a very collaborative uh, place, right? I, I think a lot of people are are willing to share information, you know, advice, you know, what's you know w what did they learn from past projects? Because we are uh, our charters to always do something that's never been done before, so we're never in. Uh, oh, we did this already. This is how you do it. It's it's already written down. We're sort of always trailblazing, right? And that's 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 what we're trying to do is is advance the technology or advance our, our understanding of something. And so, you know, it, you know, sharing experiences because that's the only way, right. We'll, we'll, we'll learn is, is learn from each other and on how, you know, how to build the next thing, how to, you know, how to approach this, what are the gotchas that had, that you ran into before and, and how can I apply that to, to the new stuff so I can get past that and, and find the next problem. Right. And, and, and work it that way. So, um, you know, it's, it's it's a uh, you know it's a bit of a cliche but it's almost like a family right we are you know we will tend to spend a lot of time together working on stuff and and you know because we all really enjoy what we do you know we may have you know discussions or arguments or you know uh, you know very passionate about making sure that the your product or whatever we're developing is is uh, uh, done well and, and, you know, because a lot of times we don't get a second chance at it, right? It, it has to work the first time. So. so you've been there 20 years. What would you uh, advise to young people coming into the industry that are maybe like you? They, they know they have a, a thing for math and science. And so they're probably looking at maybe something in engineer or in some other aspect of science. But they're, they don't, they're not sure what direction they want to go getting into space exploration in your case unmanned space exploration and aerospace what 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 would your what would your advice be yes i think part of it is 
uh, Dr. Lighty mentioned it, right, is, is you have to really have this passion and, and enjoy what you're doing. Because if, if you're, you know, if you're constantly watching the clock and you, if, if you're, when you get to work and you're thinking, well, when am I going to leave? It's probably not the best job for you, right? Because you're going to, you're not going to put your all into it, right? The, the passion, I think, is what allows us to do that extra work when we're, when we're working. And, and, you know, I, I like to say, hey, yeah, and don't chase a dollar. You know, chasing the dollar, you know, maybe you'll find a, a, a you know, a, a, a fancy startup that's going to pay you a lot of money. But, you know, you may not enjoy the work that you're doing and you're just kind of wanting to get out of it, right? And, and you know, to where, where if you just enjoy the work that you're doing, it'll come out, your work will benefit from it and it'll shine. And so I think it's really just, you know, find what makes, finds what your passion is and work towards that. And, and arguably the money's going to follow when, when you start doing really good work, that money will, will come back in. So it's, it's, you know, worry about the work, worry about doing your best job and putting your best foot out there. And then, and then everything else will, will sort of come into place. And is the constant learning something that you enjoy too? You find that inspiring? Oh, yeah. yeah. I love that. That's actually one of the parts I really love about my job is, is I can learn I learn something new every mission, right? Uh, you know, I, I, I do have a pretty good understanding across the board on, on the entire vehicle, but there might be an instrument or some of the science or, or a particular nuance of the, of the mission that, that I'm going to end up learning a lot more of. And I can, you know, I can dig right in and, and start to, you know, start to expand my knowledge base. And, and that, that's great. Dr. Lightsey, you mentioned the community factor earlier. Uh, today's a big day. Uh, what are you looking forward to uh, after the landing and, and as this project continues to develop? Yeah, well, first of all, the, the landing is, is a big deal. Um, we actually have a watch party going on here at Georgia Tech. So nice. we'll be like logging into a big Zoom call and we're going to kind of watch everything live. So, um, you know, that's, that's an opportunity to get together and kind of, we can't physically be together, but we can gather virtually. Um, and... But really, that is the beginning of the mission, right? I mean, the whole point of being there is all the amazing things we're going to be able to do, the, the science experiments, uh, the, the sample caching system is an amazing concept because it's a multi-mission goal, like to actually, you know, it's the first phase of returning something back to Earth. So, um, you know, maybe five years from now, 10 years from now, we will have those samples on earth. We'll be able to do that. But I'm really excited about just all the discoveries that are going to happen that we don't even know about because we can't imagine, you know, what we're going to see when we get there. Yeah. Exciting. Uh, any parting advice for, for our young viewers uh, or uh, maybe a little solicitation to come to Georgia Tech? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, Georgia Tech is a great school. I mean, there are a lot of great universities. Uh, one of the things I really value about the university is just having all the people with different disciplines together and, you know, the sharing that goes on of, of knowledge and love for learning. So, um, yeah, I hope, I, do what you love. Uh, that's, that's the best advice I can give you. Yeah. Eric, it's uh, still early on your side of things. What's your day going to be like today? Uh, I don't know. I maybe maybe watch some TV. Maybe try to catch a landing or something. <laughs> maybe, watch, maybe watch a landing. <laughs> no, yeah, we've uh, yeah, we we're sort of setting up the same way. We have a remote sessions that we're going to log into and watch some of the telemetry come back uh, from the vehicle. So, um, so yeah, uh, I actually you know I have two two young daughters here, and uh, I was able to uh, talk to their teachers and ask them if they can miss part of their day to. Uh, hey, it's a justifiable yeah. uh, absence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, so far, I got I got the okay. So we'll see. But yeah, so I have my uh, I have my girls here, and actually, my, did you get uh, your wife's okay too? Yeah, yeah, my wife's home too, so she'll be good. You know, so we'll we'll be we'll be watching. Uh, uh, you know, and cheering on the team. Uh, you know, we're we're now. You know, our, uh, the test bed team. We're shadowing, and we we actually were shadowing last night, and and we landed the spacecraft. So uh, we're now we're now in, in ready and standby for surface operations and and we'll be we'll be uh, you know watching along with the with the rest of the team as it comes in. So 
That's awesome. I'm so excited for you guys. I'm excited for you. I can't thank you enough for taking time to be part of the program today and, and sharing all of your insight with what you've done and what you do with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So thank you and, and uh, wishing you guys the very best. Uh, and Dr. Leitze, again, thank you for the last minute ad of being able to join us and, and sharing with us some insight regarding what you do with Georgia Tech and the programs you offer in aerospace, et cetera. Uh, you guys make exploration, space exploration uh, a lot of fun, uh, which is what we want our young viewers to understand that, you know, it's not all, it's math and science, but it can be a lot of fun too. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. So thanks guys. Uh, we're going to call it. Uh, I want to thank everybody for watching. And, and I always forget to remind everybody that this show will be available uh, by tomorrow uh, on demand. So for those of you who may have missed it, uh, you're welcome to or want to see it again in its entirety. You're welcome to, uh, to do that. Uh, my name is Vince Mickens. I'm with the Private Air Media Group. And this has been all things aviation and aerospace with a special emphasis on today's fantastic event that's about to happen, I believe, at 2.55 p.m. this afternoon of landing uh, a rover on Mars, the Perseverance and the uh, Ingenuity helicopter, uh, which is where I think people are equally excited about that too. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Have a great one. See everybody else next week. Thank sure. you. Bye-bye.